Two roads diverged in the middle of the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So says Robert Frost in his famous poem, The Road Not Taken. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of the wood, in the midst of life, and, and something causes you to step back and, and, and say, what, what is my life about? What am I really doing? What am I living for? I was interviewing a young Christian artist recently, and I asked her, what's, what's a pivotal moment in your Christian journey? And she said it was in her early 20s when her cousin asked her, do you have a purpose? She said up until that point, she had just been doing what she was good at. She was good at sports, so she did sports. She was good at art, so she did art. She was good at school, so she did school. But when her cousin asked her, do you have a purpose? She realized, what am I living for? What's my life about? What's my purpose? What's my meaning? I know for me, it was my sophomore year in college. I, I, I went on a road trip with a group of friends and we went to see the Grand Canyon. I'd never s seen the Grand Canyon before. And there's something about the immensity of that landscape that, that right sized me. It put me in my place. It, it gave me a kind of perspective on life. On that same trip, we, we found ourselves in a movie theater watching a, a movie that had just come out. I'm going to date myself here. It was called Dead Poet Society. It was 1989. And I remember sitting there listening to uh, Mr. Keating, Robin Williams say, carpe diem, seize the day, make your lives extraordinary. I remember thinking, I am I seizing the day? What, what am I living for? What is my life about? Of course, in our modern world, what some would call a secular or post-secular age, there's, there's various options for meaning, for purpose. Uh, one common option is to find meaning in pleasure, to, to find our meaning or purpose in just doing what we want, in fulfilling our desires, doing what we want to do when we want to do it. The motto of this purpose or meaning might be, if it feels good, do it. To make our purpose fulfilling our desires is really to make our desires our God. It's, it's to live for pleasure. Another option that we might choose is to find meaning in success, which is really a way to find meaning in approval. We, we look for something that others value, that others like, and we try to succeed at that. We try to achieve it. The model here might be, uh, if it looks good, achieve it do it. And so we find our value, our meaning in, in doing things and excelling at things or trying to excel at things that our society or those around us say, say are important. We're living for success, for approval. A third option might be to find meaning in a good cause. The motto here might be uh, find a good cause and join it. Uh, we look for something good to do. It could be an environmental good, a, a social good, a, a political good. We find some good cause and we find meaning in pursuing that good. This is to make doing good things for humanity our God. It's living for doing good. Of course, as Christians, we have a different answer to what life's meaning or purpose is. Uh, we often say that, that ultimately, as Christians, what our lives are about is to give glory to God. Uh, remember, Paul says that above all, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do everything to the glory of God. Um, our motto here at Biola is above all, give glory to God. The, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is an important creed uh, in, in, in Protestant history. It, its first point is to say that the chief end of human persons is to give glory to God and enjoy him forever. It, it's hard to argue with someone who says that what their life is about is to glorify God. I mean, that sounds pretty good. And yet I'm concerned that that's, that can be such an abstract notion. Is it actionable? What does it look like to give glory to God on a moment by moment daily basis? 
And so I'm concerned that we might actually miss the power and, and significance of a Christian vision of life's purpose, unless we get clear on what it means to give glory to God with our lives. Well, in this case, as in all cases, Jesus is going to help us out. There's very few times in scripture where we get something close to a definition. But here in John 15, particularly verse 8, we get a pretty clear definition of what it means to glorify God with our lives. Jesus says in John 15, 8, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now, I want to unpack this a little bit together, and I want to do that in two ways. First, I want to talk a little bit about God's glory, and then I want to talk a bit about what it means to bear fruit for God's glory. So first, God's glory. This, this Greek word is doxa. It can be translated either glory or honor. So by this, my father is honored or glorified that we bear much fruit. But, but what is his glory, and what does it mean to glorify him with our lives? Well, scripture talks a lot about God's glory and it looks like what it is, is, is God's glory is the visible manifestation of his being. It's, it's the visible manifestation of his nature, of his character. When we see through creation or through uh, humans made in the image of God, or ultimately through Jesus, when we see God's nature displayed, we're seeing God's glory. God's glory in scripture is often associated with light. And that's a good, that's a good metaphor or image for it. Just as light can be refracted through a prism and we can see the light spectrum. So too God's glory, God's nature can be reflect, refracted through what he's made. And we begin to see different features, different attributes, different characteristics of who God is. This is why Isaiah can say that the whole earth is filled with God's glory. Or the psalmist in Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The created order, especially as God originally designed it, it refracts God's nature. We see his intelligence. We see his goodness. We see his power in the things he's made. We see his glory. This is why Jesus is the glory of God. Hebrews 1, 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Since Jesus was God, he perfectly reflects God's nature. We see God's glory in the glory of Jesus. Uh, John uh, chapter one, verse 14 said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory. So that means that human persons made in God's image reflect back to God, his glory. When we reflect back to God, who he made us to be, when we live as God intended in his image, we are glorifying him with our lives because we're reflecting back to him who he made us to be. As one theologian puts it, God's glory is the reflection of the being of God from the creation back to the creator. And so as we live more and more as God intended, we're reflecting back to God more and more of who he made us to be, who he intended us to be and how he intended us to live. And we're therefore glorifying God more and more with our lives. Paul says it like this in second Corinthians three eighteen. but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image as Jesus from one degree of glory to another. We, we are glorifying God more and more, the more we're becoming like Jesus who existed as the perfect image of the glory of God. But now what is the fruit? If God's glory is, and to glorify God is to reflect back to God who he made us to be. When Jesus says, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. What is the fruit? I want to say three quick things about this. In the context of John 15, it's quite clear that the fruit that glorifies God is produced through abiding in the vine in Jesus. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so there's a sense in which anything good we do, that's not done in an abiding relationship with Jesus, independence and communion. 
uh, through his life giving presence, his nourishing presence, that anything we do that's not done in him, it really doesn't amount to anything. It's not the kind of fruit that Jesus has in mind. The fruit that Jesus has in mind proceeds out of an abiding relationship with him. Uh, Marianne Thompson, who's a a commentator, uh, says this, strikingly, Jesus does not exhort his disciples to bear fruit. Rather, he exhorts his disciples to remain attached to him, the source of life. So the fruit comes out of abiding. We might say by this, the father is glorified that out of abiding in a nourishing relationship with Jesus, we bear much fruit. That's the first thing. But the second thing is this, the fruit that glorifies God, according to Jesus, proceeds from a Christ formed life. Whenever Jesus talks about fruit coming out of someone's life, he always talks about an inside out process. You'll remember in Matthew seven, Jesus says a good tree or a healthy tree produces good fruit. In Matthew 23, he talks to the Pharisees about don't just clean the outside of the cup. Don't just change the outside of your life, clean the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean as well. Jesus was all about transformation of the heart, conforming our inward life to his inward life, his inner life and living out of that. So the fruit that glorifies God proceeds from a transformed life. And here, I think it's helpful to think about Galatians five and the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, gentleness, self-control, these, these inward dispositions and characteristics out of which we live our life. So we might then say, that by this, the father is glorified that out of abiding in a nourishing relationship with Jesus, we are inwardly conformed to his image and we bear fruit. But what is the fruit exactly? Here's the third point. The fruit that glorifies God is every loving word and deed that proceeds from a Christ formed inner life abiding in Jesus. And here, I just want to quote from from a New Testament uh, commentator, uh, D.A. Carson. I want to quote at length here because I I think he gives a great definition or description of what the fruit is in John 15. Here's Carson. He says, there has been considerable dispute over the nature of the fruit that is envisioned, envisioned in John 15. The fruit, we are told, is obedience or new converts or love or Christian character. These interpretations are reductionistic if if they're held by themselves. Carson goes on to say the fruit in the vine imagery represents everything that is the product of effective prayer in Jesus's name, including obedience to Jesus's commands, experience of Jesus's joy, and also peace, love for one another, and witness to the world. This fruit is nothing less than the outcome of persevering dependence on the vine, driven by faith, embracing all of the believer's life and the product of his witness. So, so the fruit is really anything good that comes out of our life, out of abiding in Jesus as we are transformed from the inside out. We might say this, by this, my father is glorified that out of an abiding, nourishing relationship with Jesus, we are inwardly conformed to his image and we move out in love for good to those around us. Now, I don't know about you, but I saw a movie recently. Uh, it's a Disney Pixar movie called soul. And, and if you've seen the movie, there's, there's one of the characters who's, who's trying to find his purpose. And, and he's decided that, that what he really wants in life is to play uh, jazz, but to play it at the highest level. And he finally gets his big break playing with Dorothea Williams and, and her jazz quartet. And he plays his show and he plays the first show and he plays uh, marvelously. And he, and at the end of the show, he comes out of the, the jazz club and he says, what do we do now? And Dorothea Williams, the leader of the jazz band says, well, we come back tomorrow and we do another show. And he said, you know, I've been living for this moment. This is what I thought my life was about. And now that it's over, I thought it would feel different. And Dorothea Williams tells this story. She says, I heard this story about a fish. He swims up to an older fish and says, I'm trying to find this thing called the ocean. The ocean, the older fish says, 
That's what you're in right now. This, says the young fish, this is water. What I want is the ocean. And I think there's a version of that story for us as Christians when it comes to the glory of God, when it comes to the purpose of our lives. It it might go something like this. I heard this story about a, a young Biola student. He walks up to an older Biola student and he says, I'm trying to find this thing they call glorifying God with your life. Glorifying God, the older student says, you can do that each and every moment of your day. Abide in the vine, Jesus. Allow him to to conform you to his image more and more and then move out in love towards the needs of those around you. Oh, that says the younger student. Now that's just regular old Christian living. What I want is to glorify God. Thank you, Steve, so much for that message. And um, lots of big concepts when we talk about a glorious life. So I'm glad that we have this chance to sort of bring it down and get into some of the details and make things maybe a little bit more practical and tangible for us. But you talked about the movie soul, which I have not seen yet. So (laughs) without giving any spoilers, what, what did you like about it and, and why? Yeah. Well, I have to admit I did. uh, So I saw it over the Christmas break and I did fall asleep twice uh, uh, the first time with my family. And then the second time I tried to watch it by myself uh, from where I fell asleep the first time and I fell asleep again. So the third time I watched it all the way through, I really did like it. Um, and, And I think it's so connected to this topic of just what is the meaning of life? So the main character in the movie is, is trying to find his purpose and he thinks you know, his purpose is to be this great jazz musician. And, 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 and the, the, I mean, without any spoilers, I mean, what he comes to realize is, no, actually uh, meaning is found in daily gifts and, and daily life. And I think as Christians, we'd want to tweak that a little bit. It's not just, um, you know, I remember there's an old uh, James Taylor song where he says, you know, he sings the secret of life is, is enjoying the passage of time. And, and I think there's something about the present moment, something about daily life and the, and the, the moments of beauty and being present. But I think as Christians, uh, Jesus wants to say something uh, a little, you know, a little bit different and in some sense radically different, which is that, yes, it is in the, the passage of moment by moment time. But for the Christian, we're, we're meant to pass through those moments abiding in Jesus and, and that that life is, is again, conforming us. It's, it's transforming us. And then it's meant to emerge uh, into the world uh, with expressions of love. So, so it's not some sort of big purpose out there. You know, I want to, I want to glorify God with my life. Oh, you can glorify God with your life right now, Mm -hmm. right in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I think soul, while it wasn't, you know, get that, that Christian sense of that, I think it was dealing with a lot of those same sort of themes and, and yeah. And for that reason and others, it was great animation, great, um, uh, great music. Um, I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 And I love how you brought in that story at the end Hmm. of his interaction with the jazz singer, Yeah. but then changing it to how to, what does that look like for a a Biola student to say, because glory can feel like it's something that's way out there and intangible and even unattainable. Right. But to say, oh no, that's just living the Christian life. Yeah. And and I think, I mean, I think sometimes this idea of glorifying God, you know, I, I want to, I want to, I want to do great things for mm-hmm. God. I want, mm-hmm. I want to, and, and, and I remember I heard one, uh, one pastor say one time that when he hears people say, I want to do great things for God, he kind of wonders if they're really saying, I want to do great things for God, you know, mm-hmm. that, that really it's more about kind of my ego or mm-hmm. it's more about uh, being noticed or, or uh, feeling fulfilled in my life. And, and so again, you know, there's that mother Teresa quote, that's kind of, that's kind of on the opposite end of that uh, to do small things with great love. And, and I think that's mm-hmm. the Jesus way, small things, you know, they might be big things, but, but that's not, that's not our concern, whether they're small or big, whatever we're doing, we want to do okay. it for the glory of God. But, and, and, and that's, that's abiding and that's loving. And, and then out of that, uh, whatever, whatever results. Right. And big things can be distracting, right? Cause they can, they can yeah. sort of suck us in they a little can suck bit us more. In. You even said you listed some alternative ways to sort of, um, 
to live life, like that we seek pleasure, we seek success, mm -hmm. um, good deeds, different ways that we seek approval. Yeah. So which do you find is most tempting in your own life? Yeah. What do you lean yeah. toward? Yeah. Well, I can see all three of them at play at the same time and it may be in various uh, stages of my life, maybe one more than the other. Um, but the one that probably hits closest to home right now is just finding meaning in, in pleasure. And, and by pleasure, I don't necessarily mean, you know, uh, it's COVID <laughs> lockdown. There's not a lot of <laughs> pleasures available, right. but, but in just doing what I want to do when I want to do it. I mean, that's, that's, it's really desire fulfillment. There's something pleasurable about just being able to do what you want to do. And, and I think that is to really, I mean, Paul talks about that, you know, that, that our, their bellies are their God. It's their desires, their, their appetites are their God. And, and I think I, I, I fall into that where it's, you know, sometimes, especially with, with young kids and, and being a, a husband and a father, you know, there's lots of people um, who want my time and want me to do what they want me to do. And so, so I fall into the trap of, of, uh, I just want to do what I want to do. And I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And again, there's something to pursuing our own desires, but mm -hmm. when our, when our desires kind of become our purpose or our meaning, uh, then again, that leads to frustration when I don't get what I want and anger and manipulation. And, and ultimately it's, it's, it's not very life-giving. And I think, again, that's the imagery of the that Jesus wants to turn us to is, is a different way to feed ourselves. It's not to feed ourselves by getting what we want. There's a, there's a little bit of satisfaction in that, but it's a fleeting satisfaction, but to, to nourish ourselves, to feed ourselves in a different way, which is this imagery of vine and branches. Mm -hmm. And so this imagery of, of a drawing near to him, abiding in him as he abides in us. And, and really, again, that's, that's the life that I need. That's the meaning or purpose that, that is, that is a never ending source. You know, Jesus elsewhere in John talks about this spring of living water right. that, that wells up in us for eternity, right? It's never ending life, never ending Zoe. And so that's this source of life that we can connect with and, and then begin to kind of live more and more of our life um, out of. Mm -hmm. And you talked about in John 15, the fruit yeah. Um, that is not just external, right? That it's, yeah. it's internal. Yeah. And so even when I think about some of the things you just shared, mm. as you try to not buy into pleasure, success, good yeah. deed for your yeah. approval, what are some things that we can do that cultivate that inner life yeah. um, that allow us to do that? Yeah. Well, um, so I think, again, the, 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 the inner life, I mean, we could even probably talk about another uh, way to find meaning in our culture today in the modern world without God, which is all about the inner life, you know, trying to, trying to cultivate um, peace or joy or rest or something like that, right? There's a lot of people who talk about that. Again, I think what Jesus is saying, he cares about our inner life, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, mm -hmm. patience. But again, it's, it's the fruit of the spirit. It's, it's, and to use Jesus's language in John 15, it's, it's abiding in him that brings about this peace, that brings about this joy. Now, that can sound very magical that somehow I just abide in the vine and, <laughs> and all of this happens. So yes, what are the practices, how to right. cultivate that? Um, I, I do think there's, there's a way of life with Jesus. I think of Matthew, you know, 11, 28, 29, 30, um, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke or take my way of life upon you and learn from me, Jesus says, and you'll find rest for your souls. So there's a, there's a way of life with Jesus in his father's kingdom by the spirit that is transformational. It's transformational, not because it's magic, but because like a branch is made for a vine, we were made for that relationship of love. It, the other thing interesting about John 15, we didn't talk about it in the talk today, but, but Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. Then he says, abide in my love. And then he says, let my word abide in you. So it's, it's this, we're abiding in Jesus, which is to abide in his loving care, his loving presence, which is to allow his word or, or his meaning to remain or abide in us. So it's really this interactive relationship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that nourishes us. And so the practices are, you know, you know, one way to put it, and I tell my students this, kind of, what's your plan 
to become more like Jesus? Like what, what's your plan? What's your daily plan, your weekly plan? What are you doing to abide in the vine? And so I do think there's, there's um, of course the obvious practices like prayer and Christian community and the role of scripture, but, but those and many others can be part of a life of abiding with Jesus in, in friendship with him, in companionship with him. And of course, this is, this is kind of all by the Holy spirit through the, you know, as, as Paul would say, walking in the spirit. So we, 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 we commune with Jesus uh, and his father by the spirit. Mm, So good. So Steve, you did your undergraduate at Biola. I did. Uh, Went on to do a few other degrees Uh between leaving and coming back. But when you think back to the, Biola undergrad, Steve, Mm -hmm. are there any things that you wish you knew then that you know now that might have changed that experience, (laughs) improved that experience, corrected some things? A whole lot of things. I'm thinking of a lot of regrets, but (laughs) it's it's been a long time since I, you know, there's a lot of gray in this beard if I grow it out. Um, And even if I don't grow it out. So... um, (laughs) Yeah. Well, when it comes to this topic, I, I think when I was a Biola undergrad, I, I, I did really try to find meaning, maybe not so much in pleasure, though that was there too, but, but maybe more that, that success, but, but mm-hmm. Christian success. I, I thought, oh, um, here's how to have a meaningful life. Um, get busy for Jesus. Just right. do a lot of things. And so I was involved in inner city ministry and, and evangelistic ministries. Mm-hmm. And I went on, you know, every missions trip Biola had to offer because I just thought I'm just going to, you know, I, I, frankly, I didn't, I didn't care too much about my classes because I thought what it's really <laughs> all about is, is right. ministry and service and evangelism. And I think what really lost in all of that, I, I mean, you know, by God's grace, I, I, he used those things in my sure. life and he used those things in yeah, other people's lives. Things. Yeah. But what really lost and what I had to get caught up on later was this, uh, this idea of, of cultivating my relationship with God mm-hmm. and actually having an inner life that could support a, a maturity that could support all of that activity. And so what I found mm. is I would get into ministry. Wait, say that again. A, 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 well, I don't know what I said, a maturity, maturity. That, that would support that activity. That's and, and, so good. and I would find that I'd get into these ministry situations. And um, again, I would, I would do some good or we would do some good. And by God's grace, he multiplied it. And yet I didn't really have the maturity to sustain it. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the maturity to, um, to treat my, my, my co fellow, you know, ministry, uh, associates well, and we would have kind of all these relational breaks, uh, breakdowns. And of course that's going to happen no matter kind of how mature we get, but sometimes we fail in outward ministry for, for really silly reasons. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's really deep character defects and, and, and immaturities in our own life. And again, in our relationship with God. So if, if I was talking to my younger Biola self, I would say, slow down. Okay. Uh, you know, there's plenty of time for God to use you. Uh, this is a time to, to find what it means to abide and to find how that abiding relationship can, can bring, first of all, fruit um, in, in our own character. And then as that, that love and that joy and that peace and that patience, and that kindness and that compassion, as that emerges, then, then, then step out on it mm-hmm. and, and don't, don't be in such a hurry to get busy for Jesus or to, you know, glorify God and or do great things for God that, that you forget as a Biola student that there's, this is a time of preparation. This is mm-hmm. a time of kind of tilling the soil. Life is only going to get more busy and more complicated. I know so that's true. hard yeah. to hear, but you know, or it's, it's kind of hard to believe, but it is. And so this is really a space uh, to draw near to God as he draws uh, near to you. So, so that, good. Yeah. Thank you. And great words to end our time on. So great. again, thank you so much, Thanks, Steve. Doreen. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.